The story you're about to enjoy is a factual tale, read to you from a fictional location. We believe. Darling, good. I was thinking that we might consider offering our dear guests a little treat of some sort. Free beheadings, madam. Oh, darling, you are so very wicked. I was thinking of offering them tea. Ah, but which tea, madam? The good midnight blend or the special midnight blend? I rather suppose that depends upon the guest, don't you, Mr. Darling? Without a doubt, madam. Madam, they're here. They've arrived. Those people. Guests, Mr. Darling. Try to refer to them as guests. Besides, you must be acquainted with some of them through all your visits to the village. Madam, you know full well that I am a solitary creature. I prefer not to know any of them intimately until it can no longer be resisted. Besides, you are the one with your pack of girlfriends. Very clever, darling. Now please, see our guests into the obsidian room. Good evening, everyone. Please follow me in this direction. Here we are. Please be eaten. I'm eaten. I'm seated. Smooth, darling. I'll take it from here. Welcome to the Midnight Library, everyone. I'm your librarian and host, Miranda Merrick. Please forgive our Mr. Darling for not quite being his own self just now. Like many of us, he fights his own nature at times. I believe him to be craving a little friendly contact, so when you see him in the village, perhaps you'll consider engaging him in warm conversation. For your listening pleasure this night, we've had a request for a well-known, yet often overlooked architectural feature of not only many old buildings, but some modern ones as well. The gargoyles. These boisterously carved stone beings inhabit the rooftops of cathedrals, courthouses, government buildings, libraries, and some cemetery structures. In some rare cases, they can even be found in the private dwellings of the people who love them. Believe it or not, the Midnight Library is home to a mated pair of living gargoyles. Lester and Lena, who are rarely seen, but their presence is often felt in our halls. In fact, tonight's reading is brought to you by Guillermo's Gargoyle Grooming. Get your grizzled little gargoyle's groove back with Guillermo's 50 Grit Sanding Kit. For a limited time only, mention the Midnight Library and receive a free coat of gargoyle gloss for that glass-like gleam. Mysterious and enigmatic in their nature, gargoyles have their roots firmly entangled in the heart of religious dogma and in mythology. Thought to represent the condemned souls of sinners turned to stone as a warning to others to repent from a sinful life, the gargoyles are also believed to be the demons and devils awaiting the arrival of the sinner in his deserved afterlife of damnation. The mythology perspective, dear guests, is the most delightful tale, steeped in fantastic lore. Dragon lore. Lovely. The story goes that in the year 600, in the town of Rouen, France, a terrible dragon prowled the river and lands. It sank goods-laden ships, caused floods, and destroyed the crops and homes of the people of the little village. The dragon was called La Gargoyle and was the scourge of the land. Then a solitary priest named Romanus arrived in Rouen and claimed his faith would empower him to conquer the dragon. All he asked in return was that the townspeople build a church and become members of his congregation, a deal to which they readily agreed, although I would love to know how many of them immediately thought he was Dragon Chow. The priest then assembled what he needed to overpower the deadly dragon, 
which one might guess would include perhaps a sword, maybe a mace, a sling, or a spear. But no, none of these items were chosen. The priest had only a bell, a book, a candle, and a cross. It is here the legend tells of how Romanus subdued the dragon by merely showing the creature his cross, and that he then led the defeated dragon back into town by fashioning a kind of leash around the animal's neck, made from a belt or ties from his holy robes. There are no notes as to the dragon's reaction to the bell, the book, or the candle. I believe that we can all agree that nowadays a pet dragon being calmly walked through the town would be about the most divine thing ever. But this being archaic times, the townspeople immediately burned the creature in the town square. However, the story reports that the entire dragon could not be burned. The head and neck of the beast could not be consumed by the fire. So these fireproof parts of the dragon's anatomy were then mounted high upon the village wall as a reminder of God's power and to serve as a warning to any other dragons who happened by. The much convinced and converted people of the town of Rouen then set themselves to the task of building a magnificent cathedral, its very structure paying elegant homage to the tale of La Gargoy, with stone representations of the famed dragon and featuring reliefs of their savior, the priest Romanus. The congregation of the newly faithful he inspired then not only grew in number, but also spread to the neighboring towns and villages and the vivid image of La Gargoy went right along with it. Now, as people in these remote areas had only heard of but not seen the now famous dragon of Rouen, they each fashioned their own version of what they thought the creature might look like, giving much uniqueness to the individual church's stone beings. This practice then continued for centuries to come, church by church and dragon by dragon. As you may imagine, if you've ever played the childhood game of whispering a story of details from person to person, the descriptive details you begin with often in no way resemble the details you end up with. So it was with the passage of time and the creation of fierce creatures placed upon sacred buildings. They became strange indeed. However, the greatest age of the gargoyle was yet to come. During the medieval period from about the year 900 into the 1500s, a time of super superstition, but also a time of war and conquest with religion at the forefront. Faith being the reason to unite and fight. The small churches and imposing cathedrals built during this time of bloody upheaval aimed to impress upon the individual that his very soul was of the utmost concern. Printed books were a rare commodity at this time, and in some areas, the majority of parishioners and the general population were illiterate anyway. So the primary message about the value of one's soul was built right into the very structure of the divine architecture the people visited and even passed by. The gargoyles were employed to most effectively deliver this message. Even if you didn't enter these places of worship, the frightening creatures were always present, glaring down at you and everyone else who passed by as a reminder of what or whom you would have to deal with should you choose to disregard the given rules. You were always made aware that not only was there a universe governed by an omnipotent God, there were also realms inhabited by these lesser but still mighty powerful demonic beings that you would be handed over to if you didn't behave appropriately. The stone gargoyles were the very embodiment of these terrifying demons. Many of the church's architects, knowing that the word gargoyle had its roots in the French word gargoy, meaning throat, caused their forms to allow function and made their fierce creatures to serve as fully operational water spouts. The necks of the gargoyles were formed outstretched, several feet in length out away from the rooftops of the buildings to carry away the rushing rainwater, thereby preserving the dryness of the building's foundation. 
The rainwater would then dramatically spew down out of the mouths and noses of the wild-looking overhead stone beasts, further adding realness to their already intensely ugly nature. In fact, this design feature worked so well, it's one of the reasons many of these now ancient temples survive to this day. I think it's interesting that the English words gargle and gurgle both share their derivation with the French root word gargoyle. Sadly, though, to me at least, any structure functioning as a drain pipe on a building is technically referred to as a gargoyle, even if it bears no ornamentation. How utterly dull. That's all right, on to better things. I love this. A stone-carved face that is not employed as a water spout is called a grotesque. Lovely word. Not all of these characters are demons per se, but human-like faces seeming to be in a permanent expression of emotion, be it disgust, shock, horror, etc. These figures are often a bit smaller and are intermingled in the ornate crown moldings, railings, medallions, and columns of a building structure. A still more appealing, fully formed creature, but with wildly mismatched anatomical components, say a lion with wings or a snake with horns, is called a chimera. Such beings from mythology are a mix of human and animal, like the Minotaur, which was part human and part bull. Gothic architecture is overrun with these fantastical beings, thankfully. Many are so unique that they have their own names, history, and lore that surround them. One such legendary character is Little Dido. From a tiny convent in the town of Provence, France, in 1160, a gentle nun, whom for the sake of this story we shall call Sister Margaret, had grown exceedingly tired of the vicious look of all of the menacing gargoyles she saw on the newly built Notre Dame Cathedral. Being the daughter of a professional stonemason, Margaret had learned a great deal about the trade directly from her father, and having a good deal of moxie and a hidden sneaky streak, the plucky nun disguised herself as one of the cathedral's workmen. She then gained entrance to the grand cathedral, hid herself away, and quickly carved and sculpted a profoundly different-looking stone creature, and securing him on one of the highest of the cathedral's roofs, she hastily left. Dido, as he is called, was made in a seated position with his knees drawn up to his chest. He has a calm, pensive expression, large, attentive, but relaxed ears, and human-like feet with charmingly crossed toes. And after Sister Margaret's departure, the sweet, genteel beast remained undiscovered for centuries, until a small, mischievous boy who had become lost while hiding in the massive temple climbed onto the rooftop to spy a way out. The boy lost his footing on the lofty edge and rolled toward the deadly edge, but was then miraculously saved by crashing into humble little Dido. The story of the charming gargoyle that protected the little boy quickly spread, and Dido became a much-noted feature of the temple. So much so that to this day, many people keep replicas of little Dido in their homes and gardens as a sort of guardian for their children, pets, and loved ones. We like to think that our living gargoyles, Lester and Lena, are protective of at least some of the Midnight Library's inhabitants. Tonight's reading at the Midnight Library is brought to you by Miss Carrie's Custom Chimeras. Wishing for a pet bunny but somehow slimier? Miss Carrie's Slug Bunnies are just what you're looking for. Miss Carrie's motto is Zygote Schmygoat. She can mate anything with anything. Just ask. Taking pre-orders for Spring Hyena Snakes now. Call Miss Carrie's Custom Chimeras. Thankfully, gargoyles as a manifestation seem as though they're going to be with us culturally for a long distance into the future. 
They are almost certainly a stable feature in the European countries, but are also a reassuring presence in some American architecture, too. In the 19th century, our nation embraced a revival of Gothic architecture. During this time, many government buildings, libraries, and churches were lavishly constructed in this beautifully brooding design style, complete with legions of grimacing gargoyles. The steel city of Pittsburgh in particular warmed to the Gothic groove of the times, and a multitude of the city's grand buildings feature roughly 20 of the old-style gargoyles, as well as hundreds of grotesques. There's even a walking tour available to be taken of the famed sites, called the Downtown Dragons Tour. There's almost assuredly some excellent examples of Gothic architecture to be found in your local nearest big city, along with perhaps some gorgeous gargoyles. We encourage you to seek them out and enjoy them most thoroughly. We are indeed fortunate to have these glorious ancient creatures among us. Thank you for visiting us here at the Midnight Library this fine evening. Mr. Darling may help you make your way to the front desk for a list of recommended reading materials, as well as some resources for those of you wanting something a little more tangible from the world of gargoyles. Please remember to stay on the blue velvet carpet, and if you go past Lester and Lena, you've gone too far. This way, please, ladies and gentlemen. If you follow along this corridor tonight, all should be well. Please, if you can, stay on the blue carpet. And you may indeed pet Lester and Lena with any fingers you do not care to keep. The Midnight Library is co-produced by Tess Feifel and Astonishing Legends Productions and is edited by Sarah Wendell with music and sound design by Ryan McCullough. Special thanks to Miranda Merrick and Mr. Darling. No part of the show may be reproduced in any manner without express written consent. Copyright Astonishing Legends. All rights reserved.